Five years ago, progressive Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez earned a name for herself after a stunning upset over 10-term Congressman Joe Crowley in New York's 14th congressional district. The outspoken newcomer did not shy away from defying the Democratic establishment, becoming the ringleader of the squad, delivering frequent blows aimed at Trump and, in turn, inviting fierce and frequent criticism from the GOP. But according to some, AOC's fiery spirit seems to have cooled, and it has them wondering whether it's a calculated move or one that she's been pushed toward from people who she irritated when she first got to Capitol Hill. Here to discuss what could be going on is Nathan Robinson, the editor-in-chief at Current Affairs. Thanks so much for joining us, Nathan. Hey, nice to be with you. So I have a feeling I'm going to end up having to defend her with the two of you uh, (laughs) because I hate a pile on. But, you know, tell us how you see, uh, you know, Congresswoman AOC's uh, uh, progression from when she got into office to to bring us to the current day. Well, I'm usually a staunch AOC defender. I'm always I'm always the one on the on the left who sticks up for AOC. I contributed to a (laughs) book, which is a collection of essays called AOC about AOC. And uh, my uh, article was called The Democratic Socialism of AOC. So I, I'm an AOC fan. Um, but this new article in, in Puck that has come out uh, suggests that she has become, a, in their words, a more subdued and party line towing AOC um, and quotes a lot of sort of anonymous high up Democratic officials saying that AOC is finally learning that if you want to succeed in Washington, you can't just go around irritating people by criticizing your own party leadership, and that she has learned this lesson well and is now calming down and doing what she ought to do on Capitol Hill, which is dedicate herself to trying to get legislation passed and and build connections, and uh, that she came in uh, trying to be a, quote, celebrity um, but now she's getting getting serious. The whole the whole article is is written kind of from the perspective that it's a good thing uh, that uh, to 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 you know make nice with the leaders of your party. And what do you make of that, Nathan? I suspect that you uh, disagree with that framing. Well, it's a good thing in some way. They are right in that if you irritate the leaders of your party, they are quite powerful. They will do things like deny you committee assignments. You will have less of a chance to get amendments to the legislation or get your legislation passed. And they will entice you by saying, if you play ball, uh, you can succeed. Um, they, the article quotes her as being, uh, according to some report, one of the least effective legislators. And maybe she'll rise on that list if she stops publicly criticizing Democrats or does it does it a lot less Um, but there is an alternate perspective that says that you know really as an as an outsider you don't want to make nice with the party this is if you listen to Shama Sawant in Seattle what she argues is that this is a dead end you might get a thing or two um she didn't even run as a Democrat and she managed to get the $15 minimum wage passed in the Seattle City Council um, by, against a hostile council by building an outside movement that then put pressure on the others in the council, on the Democratic leadership. And so the perspective is don't make, don't make nice with them, make war on them and build a movement that is going to put them under, pr- under the kind of pressure that will call, force them to have to agree to your demands. Not, uh, don't, just, don't just plead with them and maybe they'll toss you some crumbs. So I often hear people say things like, okay, well, what do you want from AOC? What do you want from the squad members? There's very few of them. They don't have any real power. Does what we just saw with that small group of insurgent Republicans in January pulling a force the vote moment wherein they withheld their votes for uh, McCarthy as speaker until they got certain very meaningful concessions, which they have been kind of exploiting and making the most of for the last month or so. Does that, does that kind of undermine this claim? And what do you make of the fact that the squad not only chose not to do that, but spent the Republicans' force the vote moment making a big show of their solidarity with Hakeem Jeffries, who is someone who has really put a target on their backs ever since they've been in Congress? Well, in the magazine I edit, Current Affairs, we actually ran an excellent article by one of our editors, Brianna Joy Gray. uh, It's an adaptation of an excellent monologue and an excellent program called Rising um, that made exactly the case that if you look at, and I publish it because I agree with it, um, the the case that when you look at what the Republicans did in the speakership fight, uh, the small group of hard right Republicans said, well, this is a moment where we have some power 
And well, how are we going to use that power? We've got this vote. We could either give them, give him our vote or withhold our vote. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to withhold our vote until he gives us everything he wants. Uh, we want. And uh, turns out that when you do that, um, they, you know, they pound their little fists, they stamp their little feet. But then eventually, because you have the vote, um, they give you what you want. <laughs> and, and so it does appear to work. And so it does appear that those who were very critical of you and of this uh, of this strategy the first time around, um, you know, you could criticize, you could debate what the demands that they should have made specifically should have been. But it seems like a moment where you have some power and you have a choice as to whether you're going to use it or whether you're going to put, quote, party unity uh, above it. And uh, I think AOC is on the record saying that she partly voted for Hakeem Jeffries because it showed the Democrats were unified and reasonable as compared with those chaotic Republicans. Right. You know, I think another really interesting juxtaposition is um, Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez and then um, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene. You know, Marjorie Taylor Greene, look, say what you will about her. She definitely has her kooky moments. Um, she was the first uh, Republican to come out against funding the war in Ukraine. And she has been beating that drum steadily until now the two front runners for the Republican ticket for president for 2024 are now saying, look, this is this blank blank check has gone on long enough. And it strikes me as such a, a an astonishing juxtaposition with um, Congresswoman AOC, who, um, you know, in, in her moment, her most sort of, you know, um, a public moment of late was wearing that tax, the, the rich dress to the Met Gala, in which it seems to me like it was the exact opposite. It was sort of a show of defiance when the truth is all of those um, millionaires at the Met Gala love paying high taxes because it actually reinforces their status and reinforces their position as elites without them having to feel guilty about it, right? And to, I'm wondering if you, what you make of the juxtaposition between them. Can we, can we see Marjorie Taylor Greene in a favorable light? in this context? Well, there are not many uh, lights that I would see Marjorie Taylor Greene favorably in, <laughs> but I, uh, I take the, the point that uh, I agree with in what you are saying is that if you are an outspoken outsider on the party, the party leadership is going to say, oh, well, this person is entirely ineffective. They are marginalizing themselves. They're placing themselves on the, on the fringe. They are ensuring that they will never get anything done. Um, but of course, they're going to say that. Um, but as you, in fact, if you look at how it really works and the consequences of being a critic of the party, if you call the party out on behalf of the party's base, um, they don't like that, obviously. They don't like it when you point out to the voters that the people who are supposed to represent them are not doing the things that the voters want them to do. Uh, but you put pressure on them and they may change their minds. They may or they may be forced to come out and endorse something that they wouldn't have otherwise wanted to endorse. So um, I, I think as a strategic matter, it is effective. I've talked to DSA state legislators around the country. I've interviewed them for current affairs. And I have you know, found that the ones who are effective say that they are effective in part because they are willing to publicly criticize the party leadership to show Democratic voters that they're not being represented. And then the party leadership goes, oh, no, 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 no. I mean, we'll... Well, they turn, then they sign on to some progressive pieces of legislation because they're scared. Yeah, I mean, uh, Ryan Graham says this a lot, right? He wrote a book called "They've They've Got You Know They've Got Power, We've Got People," and that alignment between Marjorie Taylor Greene and the fact that there are significant there's a significant section of the Republican base that is with her is, I think, where she draws her power, uh, her rhetorical power. Also, a willingness to say, "I'm I'm happy to be kicked off of committees. I'm willing to be derailed um, as long as I'm still in Congress and have this platform. I'm going to use it for this agenda." And to rally the power of the people. I think where progressives get tripped up is that they say, well, I have these incremental goals. Republicans are much more likely to say, well, if government doesn't work, I'm, it's still a win for me. And people on the left are, want, want the government to actually do things for their communities. And so they're willing to compromise more and say, I'm going to get along to go along in order to get these incremental improvements. The problem, it seems, from my perspective, is that they are overestimating the value of those incremental improvements in contrast with the bigger things they could do if they took a, a, a bigger risk. And in and and an article that Ryan recently wrote at The Intercept, I think 
really demonstrates this. He goes through kind of the political trajectory of the new Gen Z Congress member, Maxwell Frost, and the choices that he's made in radically changing his position, his public statements on Israel-Palestine, going from being someone who was marching at, you know, free Gaza rallies in, I believe, like 2011 or so, uh, to— uh, making statements that just find a lot of people, a lot of people found disconcerting, but which he made in order to pacify DMFI, the uh, APAC PACs, which have spent enormous sums in Democratic primaries against progressives and have been largely successful in keeping progressives with pro-Palestine views out of Congress. And so what do you make of that? Is that a deal a deal with the devil that people feel like they have to make, that they have to concede to these various interest groups, whether it's DMFI or other corporate interest groups, in order to get into Congress? And then what does that mean about the viability of a progressive presence in the House in the first place? Well, you saw the same thing with Greg Kazar, who recently got elected from Texas. He was a member of the DSA. And he gave some public statement during the campaign so he wouldn't cut off weapons aid to Israel. This led to him being unendorsed by the DSA locally, who disowned him, but then he got elected and now he's in Congress. And I'm sure he's not going to make much noise against Israel in Congress. Of course, AOC voted for Hakeem Jeffries every time on every ballot, and Hakeem Jeffries is, you know, pretty notorious for being a one of the staunchest supporters of Israel in the, in the Democratic Party. So but people make a calculation, right? It's not totally irrational um, for people like Kazar and AOC to say that the cost of sticking your neck out on Palestine might be your political career, no matter what you believe. It's not, not crazy to think that. Um, so they make a decision that they think that they would prefer to be in Congress and give more muted statements than to be out of Congress and speak their mind freely. Uh, this is this is this is the bargain. You have to decide whether you want to make. And and so you know, in this in this Pucker article that came out, it's interesting. They they talk about essentially they're saying that AOC. That a lot of people say she's making the rational choice. They say that she has now tried to they use it the, the phrase master the artful log rolling that leads to power. Uh, you know, uh, creating bipartisan goodwill, raising money for others in the party and the DCCC, and uh, managing up to leadership. And uh, that is that is the way that you get the small things that you that you want to get. Yeah. And of course, a lot of progressives have um, changed their minds about AOC as a consequence of those kinds of behaviors. But at the end of the day, is it going to matter? Does does the base of someone like AOC just transition from the DSAers that got her elected to a more broader national base? And uh, is it is it a politically correct decision, even if it's a politically bereft one from the perspective of the people who first put her in office? It's a tough question to answer, and we appreciate you joining us to try to get through it today, Nathan. Yeah. Happy to end it up. All right. We'll have more Rising for you right after this.